since I'm standing here with a poet, I would like this to be a highbrow event. <laughs> so I will quote uh, an eloquent artistic line from a great, great cinematic achievement, uh, Urban Cowboy. <laughs> when John Travolta's girlfriend, what was her name? Sissy looks over and says, Mama, my legs are sweating. <laughs> That's about as good as it's going to get. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do tonight, because it'll make it a lot cooler, he, in the deep south, as you all know, is... is, is you know, people love to call it the state of mind. We know that's crap. <laughs> it, it's just hot. <laughs> but if people are engaged, they don't sit and hate. The same reason that you don't see people in a church, like a congregational holiness church, they may sweat, but they are not suffering. <laughs> Whereas Methodists, they don't sit. <laughs> This is, is your little foray into the land of Pentecost. <laughs> and instead of me uh, trying to lecture, uh, I say this every time, but I mean it. I'd rather talk with you than talk at you. So I'll talk a little bit, and then let's just talk. We'll ask you some questions, and I will make a fool of myself, and it will seem Cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Your minor in psychology? <laughs> no, but I've been dumped by 47 good women. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who knows timing in a relationship is everything when it comes to the exit. <laughs> so I have learned to talk over the years and apologize. <laughs> uh, before we do anything, where are the rest of your pants? <laughs> of all the people in the world I wanted to see in shorts, that is not him. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> us being, what, 15 miles away. Uh, but the fact is, uh, there is something in the dirt here that grows good riders. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have had to descend to a very fine storytellers back into the earth just recently. Uh, there have been more that I won't name because I did not know him well, but, but Wayne Greenhall and, of course, you know, maybe the single best kazoo player in the whole deep side have left us. And I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. Uh, and I couldn't think of anything, I couldn't think of anything smart or intelligent, or even touching, because, you know, it's just, there's nothing worse than a writer who pretends to know what he's talking about. But I do know that these things often go in threes. So I was wondering, has anybody seen Gnaw lately? <laughs>
But the last time I saw Wayne Greenhall, he was doing what he has always done, which is kind of shaking his fist in the face of, of, of injustice and the ugly parts of our history. He's still shaking his fist at it. You know? He wasn't even really able to stand up. But he stopped in Tuscaloosa to talk about his new book and he shook his fist sitting down. <laughs> By God, you've got to admire a man who's ready to whip your ass sitting down. <laughs> Catherine Tucker Wyndham, when I last saw her, said yet again, I want y'all all to come to my funeral. And, and the whole place just went great. The whole place just went sad. And I couldn't let that happen, so I raised my hand and said, Miss Wyndham, could you tell me when that's going to be? Because some of us are real busy. <laughs> I think it might be the only time anybody ever really got the last word with that one. <laughs> so, We've lost it. And uh, made get together like this to talk about writing and talk about stories even a little more precious, I think. All of you know about the tornadoes that have torn up Tuscaloosa and whole Ohatchee white plains. The same tornado that went through and took most of our roof off uh, knocked down trees in my mama's pasture. Uh, those of you who are aware of her jackasses, they're safe. Or you my ass. But I did a little piece, uh, did a long piece really, for, for Southern Living on um, why we as Southerners can stand up to this stuff. And being here in Fairhope is what I like to call the hurricane's doorstep. Uh, maybe it's appropriate. So let me read you just a top of that little story. Almost nothing stood. Where the awful winds bore down massive oaks 200 years old were shoved over like stems of grass. And great pines as big around as a 55 gallon drum snapped like sticks. Church sanctuaries built on the rock of ages tumbled into random piles of brick. Houses echoing with the footfalls of generations came apart and blew away like paper. Whole communities carefully planned splintered into chaos. Restaurants and supermarkets, gas stations and corner stores all disintegrated. Glass storefronts scattered like diamonds on black asphalt. Steel beams twisted, sheets of tin tied in knots. It was as if the very curve of the earth was altered. Horizons erased altogether. The landscape so ruined and unfamiliar that those who ran from this thing, some of them, could not find their way home. We are accustomed to storms, here with cool air drifts south to collide with the warm rising map from the Gulf, where black cap clouds roll and spin and unleash hell on earth. But this one was different. A gothic monster off the scale of our experience and even our imagination. A thing of freakish size and power that tore through state after state and heart after southern heart. Killing hundreds, hurting thousands, even affecting, perhaps forever, the way we look at the sky. But the same geography that left us in the path of this destruction also created, across generations, a way of life that could not and would not come apart inside that storm. Nailed together from old-fashioned things like human kindness, courage, and utter selflessness. And yes, defiance. Even standing in ruthless house. As Southerners, we know that a man with a chainsaw is worth a ten with a clip <laughs> We know that there is no hurt in this world that cannot be cured with a casserole. <laughs> and that faith in the hereafter or in your neighbors who help you through the here and now 
cannot be knocked down. Now I know this because I came home to it. We were over in New Orleans taking Jacob to look at colleges. Because he can go free to the University of Alabama, of course, he wants to go somewhere else. <laughs> Tuscaloosa, just days before the storm, married Kate Jemison Cochran. Poor folks like me just have two names. <laughs> and her daughter, Emily. <laughs> Walked through the family house in Glendale Gardens looking for a place that 91-year-old Mrs. Cochran could shelter when the weather turned bad. They settled on a hall closet, removed two Electrolux vacuum cleaners that had been silent since antiquity, <laughs> and put in a chair. When sirens did sound in the afternoon of the 27th, Mrs. Cochran stepped into her sanctuary shut the door. She passed the time looking through things, forgotten and dusty. She picked up a cookie tin and pried off the lid. Neatly rolled inside was her christening gown, the one she wore as a baby 92 years ago. She'd been looking for that. <laughs> she is hard of hearing. Inside with her memory, she did not hear the destruction. She felt the house shake, but it had shaken before. 
Then she thought she heard someone call her name. Her neighbor, Michael Carr, had huddled in the storm as the storm tore at his walls. The first thing he did when he passed was break into her house and shout for her. It was the same all along this street. People running from house to house, shouting, breaking windows if they had to, looking, looking after their neighbors. Carr called her name again. The closet door swung open. Well, I'm fine, Michael, she said. And you were just so kind to come and check on me. As though he had, like, interrupted her. <laughs> she stayed in his house all these years because it was where she raised her children. Where she once found a live horse in a bedroom. <laughs> where every cardboard box bulged with history. It took the storm of a lifetime to move her. She walked through the ruin and rode away. But she sent Emily back for the gown. There will be great grandchildren to baptize. They must be properly dressed. You guys who are from down here on the after a storm, the thing that that startles you most, assuming that your family comes through okay, is how the landscape changes. And not the wreckage. We expect wreckage. But all of a sudden, you see things that you never saw before. Because the beautiful curtain of green hides everything. It's gone away. And that was my neighborhood. It had been named Glendale Gardens. And now, there may be a half dozen trees. And uh, that was what people noticed. You could see a water tower. I didn't even know it existed. 100 yards away. And it was almost like these people had been picked up, literally picked up. And some people were. But it was like this whole neighborhood had been picked up and set down again somewhere new, somewhere bare and bleak. How awful it would have been to have landed there alone. This is what happened. I hadn't been home five minutes when people showed up in my yard with chainsaws. People who care about me think I am not smart enough to have a chainsaw. <laughs> Y'all just keep quiet. Uh, and I'm not allowed on my roof. My own roof. Well, in a tornado, if you cannot have a chainsaw and you cannot get on your roof, what the hell are you going to do? <laughs> and all of a sudden, people just start coming. And coming. And we saw these giant trees off my driveway, and unfortunately, off of Jacob's car. <laughs> that was the first thing we got fixed. <laughs> But I, you know, I've written about people helping people. I've written newspaper stories about it. I have rarely been the beneficiary. And it almost broke my heart. It's amazing. Within a minute of stepping into my yard, I was met by a never ending stream of people. There are too many to list. I'd leave someone out. But they came, capable men who knew how to run a saw or twist a wrench. In a situation like this, an incapable man, does that work? Is that work? Or is it uncapable? <laughs> Un.
and they don't give that Harper Lee Award for grandma. But what good is an incapable man in such a time? They came, my son's drama, you know, music teacher, sent her husband to run a saw. We dragged trees and we told lies. Every church group in Tuscaloosa, it seemed, called rubble out of my yard. Meaning I can never again say anything mean about the Episcopalians. <laughs> but maybe the most touching thing that happened came a few days after the storm. And I, I mean, because, you know, when you talk here in Fairfield, you know, you hear people from everywhere. So if you start saying many things about our northern brethren, all of a sudden the book line gets a lot shorter. Now I've got my damn point. But at that time, what you, what you need more than anything else is to not give in to your nature. And my nature is to not work. <laughs> These volunteers like to kill me. At one point, I went in my own backyard and hid from people helping me. <laughs>
They just appear. Now, I know they appear down here when y'all have an emergency. But I thought I might read this story of the, of the awful destruction there, knowing it'd be hot as hell in here and it'd make you feel like you're lucky. <laughs> I really would rather talk with you than talk at you. Uh, I can read from uh, the books that I've already written, but the truth is that uh, you already know most of those. And so I'd rather talk about whatever's on your mind. So you did you have, did you have a movie that he's one of the first things that called you to the attention of the world was your reporting on the big tornadoes in the early 90s, uh, northeast of Birmingham, was it? Yeah, one of the first things that I wrote for the New York Times was a uh, tornado that destroyed the church. And uh, I was trying to make sense, I guess we always do in situations like that, trying to make sense of that. And I was trying to explain to uh, New York Times readership, you know, why people after brick walls tumble onto a Sunday school, why people would then go back to a church for answers and help. Why is that? And I cannot, I can't quote the lead in something like, uh, this is a place where the song, Jesus Loves Me, has rocked generations to sleep. This is a place where old women hold babies on their lap and whisper in their ear that the lights in the sky are just holes in the floor of heaven. And this is a place where heaven is not a concept, but a destination. You know, try to explain that sometimes. You know, I just wanted to try to get a handle on that. And, uh, and I guess we'll all be trying to get a handle on that until our last break. Uh, but yeah, I've had some experience at it. Uh, the best thing that, that I got to write about this time was uh, my boy Jake. Uh, well, let me just read you. Just a little bit of that. This don't mean you can't buy the Southern Living when it comes to <laughs> Sometimes, to break a spell of death and destruction, you just have to drop a house on a witch. <laughs> My boy, who is 17 and sometimes insufferable, <laughs> Moped into the den last spring to announce with much sighing that the drama and music teachers at his school had settled on The Wizard of Oz as the final production of his junior year. Over the years, he'd swaggered across the stage as a tortured drifter in picnic, mugged as the mad dentist in Little Shop of Horrors, and smoked some Shakespeare. He had hoped for serious theater, maybe some Tennessee Williams to test his talents, but instead got this little kid's play. He was unhappy for about two days till he found out that the most beautiful girl in his school was going to work with him personally to <laughs> choreograph his dance stage. <laughs> Try out for Scarecrow, he said. That's the one looking for a brain, I said. <laughs> I will not torture him anymore, but to make a long story short, they turned through rehearsals for this, and then the tornadoes come. How in the world do you have a play that involves dropping a house on somebody? So one teacher at the school said, we can't do this. Another teacher said, we have to. The 
Because if we don't do it, that will be one more good thing taken from these kids. And they went ahead. And I think the, they usually get about 120, 130 people in production. It's a small school. And they packed the gymnasium. Because people wanted to come and be part of something normal again. It was about as much fun as I've had in a long, long time. Which speaks to just how dull my life is. <laughs> story this way. It will not fix everything. It will not raise walls. But my boy Jay, who worked like a man digging stumps and hauling limbs, that night he danced across the stage with a girl in booty slippers in his arms. Little Sophie Petrovic, whose house just down the street from ours was destroyed, Cavorted in a blur of munchkins, as if all evil winds are just props on the stage. We end it with something I've always wanted to write. The show does go on. Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> I just always want to write that. That is the last I will torture you. You can take a break. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Yes, ma'am. How long have you had the jackasses? <laughs> He's about 17. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, the reason that people that 
brothers wind up the newspapers writing about serious things is to eat. <laughs> anything in the world. Well, that's a big lie. I almost just stood right here and told a big lie. <laughs> if I could do anything in the world, I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> Sheet out, and you throw it 
throw it over your shoulder, smoke it. Smoke it. And then you get ready to write some more. But that news is fickle. And it flips away. That's the way rich folks write. <laughs> Again, poor. You sit down one day and you ask yourself, what's the most important goddamn thing I've got to say? What's the most important thing I have to say? What's the most precious thing in the world to me? And it occurs to you it's your mother. So you write an image because you don't want to preach. And you think, what image in my life, what scene captures that? And you sit down and you write, I used to stand amazed and watch the red birds fight. They would flash and flutter like burning rags through a sky unbelievably blue, swirling, soaring, humming. And on the ground they were a blur of feathers, stabbing for each other's eyes. And I'd watch grown men stop what they were doing, stop pulling corn, or lift their head out from under the hood of a broken down car, just to watch it. And once, when I was little, I watched one of those birds peck itself to death on the side of the nerve of a truck, hurling itself against that unyielding image until the glass was cracked and smeared with blood. And I asked an old man who worked for Mama Lea, an old snuff dipping man named Charlie Dennis. I said, Charlie, why did that bird do that? And he told me it was just its nature. And then he called you agent. <laughs> <laughs> and they pay you when it's due, and you, and then you're out of money, and then pretty soon you ain't going on. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I think you you write. I don't believe that you write always when you just feel it. So you write writing. I hate to say this. I hate to break anybody's. You know, lovely frequency notion, but, but writing is a very blue collar thing. It's a very working like thing. You have to do it whether you feel like it or not. If you just do it when you want to, then you'll be that lady under the willow tree. And I don't think I've ever read anything by her. <laughs> No, but here's the thing. Show me a writer selling books who says, you know, I don't want you to read my book on the Kindle. I don't even want you to buy it. If you're, if you're going to read it on the Kindle, just don't buy the damn thing. I haven't met that guy yet. I'm sure he's out there. You know, Rick, I had an interesting thought today. I wonder if the publisher is able to tell a writer your book has been sampled a hundred times, but no one's bought it. That would be a hell of a letdown. Martin, have you started drinking early? <laughs> Read 
old man in the sea. <laughs> Don't put it down. Many people read old man in the sea in one sitting. Don't put it down. Just hold it. Hold that hot plastic. <laughs>
And feral slams uh, run with a horseman. It's in that. It's in that. There's a beautiful line in either Run with a Horseman or Whisper of the River where uh, a woman in church looks at the little fellow and says, and during the prayer says, and let us hope that this young man does not feel too good about his little self. <laughs> and that actually is pretty good advice. I have a thing on my wall that says, celebrity is the last refuge of an idiot. <laughs> uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm moving as fast as I can, Gene. Yeah. Critically acclaimed Hey Boo performance. Uh, do you have any uh, plans to change your direction for more big streets? We've actually, you know, the thing, and friends of mine have heard me say this before. Before I will deal with anybody, say from Hollywood, I would take a hammer and beat myself on my own toes. <laughs> It's just, I know there's money in it. And to be brutally honest, we turn down truckloads of money for all of them but the shower. Because the people that was going to do it, they were well meaning. But then everybody I met and had a, from Hollywood that had a longer conversation with for more than like 12 minutes was a damn chucklehead. I mean, a chucklehead. I mean, the kind of guy, if you like, were walking across the street and say, Is anybody coming your way? He wouldn't know how to answer. <laughs> so they're just chuckleheads. And I don't really, I'm sorry. My time is limited. I'm 51 years old. I have high blood pressure. I've got no time for chuckleheads. <laughs> and uh, uh, theater. Uh, Horton Foot gave us a call about eight. I got real excited. I got real excited. And of course. Uh, so there are people out there that I would love to see take one of the books and turn them into something. But they would have to not be chuckleheads because these are people I love. And all in the end, all you've got when all your other bullshit has been exposed, all you got is family. So I have to be real careful. That's a good question too. We take one more from someone? Yes, sir, I'm sorry. I, I, I naturally kind of look that way. Yes, sir. Over the years, you've had a modicum of success. A modicum. A modicum. And I've always been curious, just now that you are very successful, how many pairs of weeks you can do you have? <laughs> Penny loafers do I have now that I'm successful? And I thought he said, How many pairs of them Ouija panties do you have? Recommend the Izod Cotton 
easy way to <laughs> Big cement block, and you put it in there. 
and he walked up to the plate glass window at the publishing house. <laughs> I'll let you figure out which one you throw. <laughs> Maybe throw the other one in. And hope that not only does it land in their lap, but that they swallow it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard.